Good afternoon, everybody. It's great to be, great to be here with you again today. Um, welcome to our webinar titled U.S. Customs Brokerage 101 Tariff Classification. Um, today's webinar is sponsored by SCARU. Scarborough University was founded in 2006 with a mission to provide necessary, relevant, and continuing education to Scarborough employees, clients, and professionals engaged in international and domestic trade and logistics. The webinar does qualify for CCS and CES continuing education credits as well. My name is Kevin Ekstrand. I'm a licensed customs broker and certified customs specialist, and I have the privilege of being vice president of sales and marketing here at Scarborough University or Scarborough International. It's an honor to be with you. This is an interactive webinar, and we are here to answer your questions, so please submit questions. You will find the Q&A button at the top of your screen. Your questions will appear for the audience to see, so you may choose to show your name or be anonymous. Please note that if you are an anonymous um, question maker, that if you have a specific question that we cannot answer in today's time frame and or because of the specifics or needing to know more information, uh, we may ask you to email us um, after this webinar in order to get your name so that we can follow up directly one-on-one -on -one with you. Um, we have a great deal to cover today. Um, so I'm going to, to bypass the big intro about Scarborough, but, but wanted to say that Scarborough is truly a great partner to our clients. We collaborate, stand by their side, and actively participate in their growth opportunities by helping them navigate import and export regulation around the world. We value each and every partnership along with each and every relationship we build along the way. As always, I would like to thank each and every one of you for being here today. I will be working with my friend and colleague, Allison Schroer today. Allison is a licensed customs broker and certified customs specialist, as well as the branch manager of our Kansas City office, um, where our studio rests. Mm -hmm. Like me, she has worked on the importer and broker side um, and provides a great outlook on for, for both, and I'm looking forward to presenting with her today. So to begin with, um, We've got some information on there about Scarborough International, but we kind of wanted to put together um, kind of a, um, the reason that we do this, and we've never really talked about it that much in these webinars, but it really goes back to the Modernization Act, where Customs came out with um, some initiatives of shared responsibility, whereby they'll educate the trade on the required laws and, and inform us of what those are, and they do that through informed compliance publications. They do that through uh, their, uh, um, CSMS messages to the trade and, and you can go on their website and you can uh, subscribe to those messages and, and it's great info. And, and the ultimate goal that we're trying to achieve here is reasonable care and that means that, that are you doing the best that you can with the, with the uh, based on the size of your business and so forth to, to, to do things compliantly as it relates to um, customs regulations, uh, 19 CFR and so forth. And if not, then they're going to be forced to enforce those regulations against you. And that's really what the, the premise of the Mod Act is. And, and the reason is, is that there's penalties. And we included those penalties today. And those penalties are based on, on different degrees of culpability, whether that's uh, negligence, gross negligence, and or fraud. And the penalties, um, penalties increase based on that. I just saw a message uh, this week about a, uh, about a large, I think it was a 600,000 plus penalty for someone misclassifying some sugar. Um, and that, that's, a, that's a big deal, that, that, that they thought they were doing it, it, it correctly, they found that they weren't, they found that they knew that they weren't classifying it correctly and continued not to do, to do it correctly, and therefore um, they, were, they were hit by penalty by customs. And that's really the purpose of why we do what we do with all of these webinars, is to help you maintain that level of reasonable care that you need as an importer and or exporter to, to avoid these types of penalties. Um, and just some information about what those are, false statements, that's always easy to, to tell, to, to determine, you know, was there something wrong, was there an omission? That one's a slam dunk, and then it comes down to materiality and culpability, which can sometimes be a little more difficult, but we want you to be doing the right thing all the time. And, um, and then again, there, no black and white definition here, but we also wanted to list the, the five areas of most concern, and that is valuation, classification, quantity, 
country of origin, and record keeping. Those are the areas that we find the most. Today we're going to focus primarily on classification, even though we'll do a, just a quick overview of some record keeping requirements and things like that. But anyways, kind of wanted to give a bigger picture about why we do what we do with these webinars and make sure that, that you understand what the, what the rules are as it relates to fines and penalties um, in order to meet your standards that are out there. Yeah, you want to go? Mm -hmm. So I'm going to turn it over to, to Allison here to kind of give you a little bit of an overview, and then we're just going to kind of bounce back and forth, get through these slides quickly. Now, we, we have provided you with a ton of slides, and you'll get these as part of the recording like we always do with our webinars. So you'll have these slides as to add to your arsenal for, um, for learning at, at your own facility. But we're going to move through them quickly and probably not touch on many on, on all of them, but we wanted to provide them um, for you specifically. So I just wanted to preface that because we really want to get to your questions. So this next slide is just, it's the basic import process, um, kind of just step by step in very simple terms, uh, you know, purchase order, goods are manufactured, they leave the factory, so on and so forth. Um, we've so shown this slide in previous presentations, but we kind of added a couple steps into this one, um, including when the importer security filing is required. We need to make sure that's done before the goods leave the foreign port, um, that you send all your required, your required commercial documents for your entry to your broker before it arrives in the U.S. so we can make that entry. Um, and then going on to say that we can go in and view now your data in the ACE portal, which is a change um, with the transition over to ACE, which makes it great for you to be able to quickly go in and run reports to see what your broker's filing on your behalf. So what's required? Uh, this is a really great slide. We've got, for, ma for making entry, you need commercial invoice, packing list, bill of, aid, bill of lading, certificate of origin, if applicable. And then one thing to always consider is what's going to be required for PGAs. And that's going to be your partner government agencies, FDA product codes, uh, registration numbers. If it's Lacey Act, we need all the details about the genus and species of the wood. Um, and all of this information, we're going to take all of it, put it all together to make that entry for you. Um, also, your, your surety bond. So there's two different kinds of bonds we can get for you. Single transaction bond, which is a one-time bond, um, which if you plan to import just a few times during the year, that might be the best bet for you. Uh, when it won't be good is if perhaps the value is very high or if there's a PGA involved like FDA because you have to purchase a bond that's three times the value of your goods. So we really kind of go for continuous bond if you're going to be importing on a regular basis. It makes the most sense. It's a 12-month period. That was a one-time fee. It covers your ISFs and everything. It's, it's really the way to go. Quick slide on record keeping here. Um, some of these things now have changed a little with the introduction of ACE. All documents required to the transaction still have to be saved for five years from the date of entry. But now that the ACE portal is out there, you don't need to have that paper 7501. The record is the ACE portal. Uh, but you will still need to keep your commercial invoice, your packing list, bill of lading, everything else. All right, these are just some general classification tools. Things that we as brokers go to regularly and encourage our importers to look at as well when it comes to determining classifications for goods. So there's all kinds of resources out there. We've got some links at the end of this um, presentation as well. But just everything from looking at cross rulings, um, case law, the general rules of interpretation, which Kevin will get into a little bit deeper later in the presentation, explanatory notes, um, the HTS US index, um, customs informed compliance publications. There's really all kinds of tools out there that we can use. So we're going to kind of get into the classification, how to classify now. So we first really have to get all the facts about your product, um, all the descriptive terms and literature, the qualities, what it's made of, if it's chemical, you know, the characteristics, uh, the use of your product at the time of import. We're gonna identify all possible classifications, um, to use the alphabetical index, table of context, uh, binding rulings. Binding rulings we use quite frequently. It helps kind of push us in the right direction if we're not exactly sure where to start sometimes. Um, 
apply classification rules to determine the correct classification. Um, if more than one classification could apply, we can go to the uh, general rules of interpretation <laughs> and uh, determine at that point which is going to be the best fit. So then there's the five general provisions here, which we have a more in-depth slide on. Um, oh, this is a... Yeah, see, I, I usually think of this one, you know, when there's different areas and, and we kind of put them in a hierarchy and you know, what is, what is the specific, specific name, which is EO nominee, we try to name it. We're going to kind of talk about this later on in the general rules of interpretation too. Principal use, um, what is the actual use versus principal use? Is this a part and what parts provisions might, might apply and or is it a basket catch all category? And we find a lot of, uh, by following the general rules of interpretation, we have to know what these specific things are. Um, in order to, to really, because that is the premise of the general rules of interpretation, that, that we look at these specific types of things. But we kind of wanted to categorize them to you, because as you become more familiar with the tariff class, with the tariff, and, and, and maybe you're a geek like I am, um, you know, when you walk through stores and, and mm -hmm. you see products that you've helped import and things like that, you, you know, I, I think often, you know, well, we did that under actual use. We did that under principal use, or that's EO nominee, that is in the tariff by name. Uh, meaning it's specifically in the tariff, uh, or that's a parts provision, or you know what, we don't really know that, that there's not a specific provision for this, so it falls under a basket category, which is really in the tariff, you'll see is other, 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 and, and, uh, and Allison's got some examples of what the tariff looks like, where you'll see some of those differences. So I will admit, the first time I looked at the tariff, it kind of overwhelmed me. <laughs> but once you kind of figure out what you're looking at, and how to read it properly, it really makes sense. So our first example up here, we have 84, 14, 90, 41, 65. So we can kind of look through here and see that 84, 14 is air or vacuum pumps, air or other gas compressors and fans, ventilating or recycling hoods, incorporating a fan, whether or not fitted with filters, parts thereof. And then we drop down here to parts and to other, and this bar is up my thing and that says other. Other compressor, compressor housings. housings. <laughs> so it's very specific to parts of compressor housing. Mm -hmm. And we can see that this is also duty free classification. Yep. And this is kind of the breakdown of our, of our classification here. First two numbers of the chapter. Um, there was chapter for everything <laughs> from plastic to knitted goods to woven goods. You know, there's every kind of chapter you can imagine. Um, the next two digits of the heading, followed by the subheading and then the statistical reporting. And this is one of my favorite slides, by the way that we've created this, because when we go through the general rules of interpretation, one of the first rules is that we always look heading to heading. And so we always look at chap, you know, chapters and we look at 8414 compared to others, and then subheadings and so forth, that we keep them on the same level. In a sense, I imagine that you've got a piece of paper and you're sliding it across when you're comparing multiple headings because like Allison, um, you know, when we look at a product, we automatically come up with two, three, four, five different places in the tariff that we think that this product could probably be. And then we use that, that heading chapter um, subheading to, 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 to work our way to finding the correct classification towards it. So here we are again with a, another picture of the tariff, but it's, We've kind of pointed out a few things that are um, we feel are important. So, uh, the first six digits are recognized internationally. Um, so that's generally a good tool if you're going to be shipping outside of the country, or people are shipping into the country. They'll list a Schedule B that helps kind of push us in the right direction on where we can look to determine the classification. Um, last four digits here we can see are for also for statistical reporting. Um, here's a little bit of information on what's on the right side of the page. So we can see for this classification here, um, 8701, 20, 00, you know, 15, 45, or 80, those are all going to be 4% duty. Also, the statistical quantity to be reported to the U.S. is going to be number. The stack quantity can be anything from kilos to thousands to do dozen pairs um, to nothing to nothing no, no report of yes. quantity so, even sometimes 
And uh, then in the column there, from the rates of duty, the special column, that's going to be um, if there's a special rate of duty or duty-free treatment based on free trade agreements. I think let's stop there real quick because when someone was uh, when when we when we ask you to register for the event, you're allowed to put some questions. Okay. And one of the questions uh, that was that was asked was um, was determining the uh, tariff rate for specific uh, countries. How do you determine the duty from the different countries? Mm -hmm. And I think this slide kind of shows you that once you determine a harmonized tariff number, you've got the general duty rate, and that applies to all countries unless unless they qualify for one of the special provisions in the special column. And those special provisions in the special column are going to be specific, usually related to free trade agreements and or GSP, generalized system of preferences, um, that, that would qualify. So the thing is, is that the first thing I always look at is what is the general duty rate? And then I say, what, what country is this from? And does it qualify for one of the few free trade agreements. Now, we, we as a country need more free trade agreements, in my opinion, but what does it qualify for a special duty rate based on the, uh, the, the country of origin and, and, uh, and things like that? So that's how you determine. So first you determine the product, the harmonized tariff number, and then you look at the duties in the general and special column to determine if, if it's going to be the general duty rate and or if that country qualifies for a free trade agreement and or generalized system of preferences or lesser developed countries provision. So that's the only difference between countries. All the same unless they qualify. And again, it can be from a qualifying country and still not qualify. There's specific rules to make sure that it qualifies. There's a burden of proof anytime we utilize the special column. That means that we probably need, as Allison had mentioned, a certificate of origin from that country that, that specifically identifies that country as the origin in order to qualify and that it meets those rules. So that's, that answers one of those questions that was uh, asked in advance. Okay, we just have another option here of some things that you might see when you're looking at the tariff. Um, for example, here, this one, the first red box in the middle of the general column has 6.5% and then one slash. So you can go to the bottom of the page and it will have, send you to the next place in the tariff where you get to look um, because there may be additional provisions for this tariff. Um, and then also in the far right in column two, um, if perhaps the importer was bringing something in from Cuba or North Korea, um, they'd be looking at an additional duty rate. So 2.2 cents per kilo plus 33.5%. And if you looked over to the right, you'd see if it was from anywhere else, basically, it'd be 6.5%. So yeah. big difference. So the, the, yeah, someone just asked what is column two. So yeah. Yeah. Um, that is the uh, for some of those embargoed countries that, that we don't have open and, and regular trade with. And they also asked specifically what is GSP? Um, I can answer that real quickly. Uh, GSP stands for the Generalized System of Preferences. That is a list of countries. And again, it is in the Harmonized Tariff book, you know, which is about six inches thick right now. Um, but it lists specific countries that um, maybe are lesser developed and that therefore goods could qualify for, um, for lesser trade on some of those countries in the past, Indonesia, Thailand, Vietnam that we see. Um, Vietnam's I don't think are no longer on there, but GSP is, is usually passed in a miscellaneous trade bill by Congress and it can expire um, and, and we, we often watch that. I, I know that Thailand is a, is a country that's been on the GSP list that, uh, that a lot of folks use and when, they, when GSP expires it then means that all of those goods are then subject to the general, uh, general duty rate um, column again. Mm -hmm. So anyways, that's so always watch for those miscellaneous trade bills, watch for GSP if you utilize it, and make sure that you're engaged with your congressman, man or woman, to, uh, to make sure to lobby for that because it'll benefit you in the, in the long run. So that's what GSP is. So. All right, on to the uh, GRIs. Can I do a question? I'm good. I'm good. All right. So we want to talk uh, real quickly on uh, general rules of interpretation. We're making good time because we want to at least leave a half hour to, to answer other additional questions for, for, for today. But the general rules of interpretation are the set of hierarchical rules 
that we as customs brokers and you as importers need to make sure you follow and or document that you follow these when, uh, when trying to classify a product. I know that you see on our uh, on our newsletter about uh, general rate increases, which is also a GRI. It's a bad GRI, by the way. Um, but general rules of interpretation; these are good general rules. And again, it, it, it follows a hierarchical order, meaning that we look at general rule of interpretation one first. If we can't determine the tariff classification utilizing this rule, then we go on to the second rule, and then the third rule and so forth until we can ultimately determine what the tariff classification of the product is. Now, Allison had mentioned all kinds of tools that are available for us to, to, uh, to utilize, but the first thing we want to start with is what tariff number do we think it's at? And then we try to find validating rulings, um, case law, things like that to, to help support that, uh, that end rule, and we utilize the, the general rule. So I'm going to go through today really the first three, which, uh, which are really important, and the ones that if you can't find it using the first three, then um, then there's some additional rules, but we spend most of our time on the on the first three. And it, in in rule number one, we talk about the um, classification shall be determined according to the headings, sections, and chapter notes. And we identified the uh, tariff earlier that had chapters, headings, subheadings, and uh, and then the tariff item as well. But so. This rule says you need to look at the chapter notes, you need to look at the section notes in order to, uh, to determine what the tariff classification is because certain notes might exclude um, certain specific items and or and there are other things. So we included an example here and, and again that you have to you compare heading to heading. We kind of talked about that at the beginning. That first four digits is the heading. If, we, if we're looking at an item, we want to compare two things. And I use the example of an electronic toothbrush. So an electronic toothbrush um, heading 8509 is for electro, electro mechanical domestic appliances. Heading 9603 is for brushes, brooms, and so forth. Okay, so when we're comparing heading to heading, um, which one seems to be more correct? But if I look at 960321, I see that that is a subheading and it says toothbrushes. Okay, so if I compare the one that says toothbrushes at a subheading to the heading 8509, I'm not comparing on the same level. And therefore, I would end up classifying this product wrong because 95 or 8509 is actually the correct classification for electric toothbrushes where 960321 is for the manual toothbrush that you would utilize. So again, we have to compare heading to heading to find the right area first. We can't compare subheading to heading, and that's why I give that example. Um, and then it says in the rules, and it says it at the bottom of each rule, if you cannot determine the classification using rule one, we have to move on to rule number two. Step two. Um, but here, here's one, one more example, chapter uh, um, of a, um, of an item here, um, baby safety spoons, you know, the little metal spoon that has a nice little mm -hmm. tip if you've had children or ever fed a child, and it's got a little plastic thing on there. Um, if you look at specific notes, and again, we have to look at notes, chapter 82 is where I would normally classify a spoon because it's in the tariff by name in chapter 82, but note one to chapter 82 says that this chapter only covers articles with a working edge or working surface of metal. Well, the plastic coating on that is really what you're using to feed the baby. Mm -hmm. um, and therefore, based on this one note, you cannot classify that baby spoon in chapter 82. All right, it has to be moved to chapter 7323, which is articles in metal and stainless steel. Okay, so that's an important, important example. And the duty rate will be different based on that too. Okay, so again, it, it, it can be very complicated and very confusing and that's why we would also look at rulings to help support some of those uh, some of those initiatives as well. All right. General rule two says that any reference to a heading or an article shall include reference to that item unfinished. I consider this, and then headings including mixtures, combinations, and so forth, um, are, are are part of that. And if we can't utilize this rule two, then we would utilize general rule three. The general rule two is really the bicycle rule. And if you want to flip this over, the bicycle rule is, is that when you ship a bicycle, it typically ships unassembled so that you can maximize the space and things like that. Well, when you open the box, it still looks like a bicycle. So you're going to classify it as a bicycle. You're not going to open the box and classify it as rubber tires and, and spokes and, and, and those in 
seats and handlebars and those kinds of things, you're going to classify it as a bicycle because it is complete. Now it might be missing the tires um, and it can miss certain pieces and still be classified as a bicycle, but that's kind of what the, that general rule two says, is that it includes that item um, as though it was unassembled as well. And then we would just look at that essential character and you're gonna hear essential character a couple more times in order to determine the final classification of the item. Um, essential character is really an analysis that, um, that you hear Allison say often, I know I say it often, I send it in emails to folks all the time, is what is the essential character of this item, especially if the item is a mixture of, of two goods and or two chemicals, those kinds of things, I, I ask that question. And, and the, the definition are, are some factors that we put to, to create a definition of that is the nature of the material or component, is it metal, is it plastic, um, the quantity or weight by value, um, role of the constituent materials as it relates to the use of the good, and uh, attributes which strongly marks or serves as the distinguishing factor of the item. Um, and or its core core use and, uh, and conditions. So anyways, essential character is, and again, the problem with essential character is it is subject to our interpretation. Mm -hmm. And our interpretation is often determined by our backgrounds. Allison was from Eastern Iowa. I'm from, was from uh, the Kansas City area my whole life. We've probably experienced different things, which would, which would make us look at a product a little bit differently. Um, and so anyways, we've got to think about that when we use essential character and that's why we utilize case law and so many other things to, to help us uh, validate our own opinions. Um, general rule three, it's one of my favorite rules because in general rule three, it says that if by application of general rule two, you have two goods that are prima facie, meaning on the face of the item, classified in two or more headings, classification classification will determine by this. The heading that provides the most specific description, remember how we talked about primary use, we talked about EO nominee, basket provisions, parts provisions, based on the, the one that's most specific, unless it refers only to the substance of the part. Mixture or composite of the goods set up for retail sale, which cannot be classified according to the heading with the most specific direction, is consisting of the material substance which gives them the essential character. Again, they use essential character. So what that's saying is that if we have two items and we can't tell, we have to ask the question, which one is the essential character? And then we'll classify it according to the essential character. In a sense, we're going back to one of the other general rules of interpretation to determine. And then the last one says that if that doesn't work and we still don't know the classification, there is no essential character of the item, which again is based on our, our, our opinion sometimes, then we have to class it based on the one that's last in the harmonized tariff system. And this is a rule that is often utilized in apparel. So say you have 50% cotton and 50% um, polyester, you're going, you're going to utilize, unless the essential character of one of the items stands out, you're going to utilize the tariff number that's last in the tariff, okay? if you cannot determine an essential character of, of the item. So that one's often used in, in clothing that we use the one that's last in the tariff. Um, and again, what are we looking at? Rule of relative specificity. What is the most specific rule? Um, the heading requires more difficult to satisfy. It's typically the rule that we would use because it, it, if it needs all of these specific things, then, it's, then, it, then that's probably the provision that we need to utilize for, for say, a, uh, uh, basket provision, and I've got them listed there on the on the slide. You know, actual use, principal use, EO nominee, parts provisions, basket provisions, and and again, you're saying why is EO nominee not the same? Because we used that in the toothbrush example. Mm -hmm. Toothbrush was not the right place to put the electromechanical appliance. So, anyways, let's look at those. And um, here's some examples of some headings: 9025. Um, which is a more specific heading than say 9033, which is parts and accessories thereof. Okay, that would be more of a basket category. And go one more. Um, if we've got a kit that, that's consistent of, um, and kit, kits are kind of in their own world. In a kit, let's use the example of a roadside kit, yeah. right? In a roadside kit, you might have some flares, you might have some triangles, some reflective triangles. You might have a blanket, a mm -hmm. flashlight, 
a screwdriver or something like that that says, hey, if I'm in trouble, these are the five or six ingredients that I will need in a roadside, roadside kit. If it all serves that function of meeting that roadside kit, then it can be classified as a kit. But say you take that one example and then you throw on some crayons and a coloring book. <laughs> I know, that might be, it might be necessary. It, right, if, if you have kids, <laughs> right. But, but that kid, an example, by just throwing in two items that aren't relevant to fixing the car and or the hazard of the road could make you then, that's not, and by customs probably would not be considered a kit because the coloring book and the crayons don't really have anything to do with specifically helping you in, in a hazard on the road. Um, and therefore you would have to break it out and classify it completely separately. So we have to look at kits very, very specific to their use and make sure that all the items in a kit and many of you that are on this call, I know I've worked with you in the past on kits. Um, and, uh, and we always ask those questions. Sometimes we laugh and sometimes we say, well, let's not, let's move, remove this one item. And then we know that we can classify it as a kit moving forward. Um, and again, don't, we have to remember not to forget inside of kits, country of origin markings. And we have some great techniques here as a customs broker to break out things based on tariff numbers, but still classify it as a kit. We call it XDVs, things like that. So, and my favorite, and I include this example all the time when I'm talking about general rule of interpretation three, is a fishing rod and fishing reel put up for retail sell. Um, and again, when we're talking about um, um, interpretation and what we feel like, you know, I would ask you, Allison, which is the essential character, the rod or the reel, in your opinion? <laughs> Good question. I mean, do I mean, you, do you have I, one? Maybe. Because to me, to me, it was the rod. I was going to say the rod. Too. I was going to say the rod. I mean, and, and honestly, I did say the rod. Mm -hmm. This is a question that I actually missed on the customs broker's license mm -hmm. exam. Because to me, I can still catch a fish with a rod and, and, not, and I don't need the reel. But in customs evaluation of the rod and the reel, they've determined that there is no essential character between the rod and the reel. And therefore, it should be classified based on which one is last in the harmonized tariff system. So this was one that, as I was leaving the test in St. Louis, I called someone in my office and said, <laughs> can you look this up for me and mm -hmm. see if there's an essential character here? And they did, and they found several rulings on it, and it determined that the real, so driving the three hours from St. Louis <laughs> to Kansas City, I knew that I missed one of the <laughs> classification of rods and reels. So I've included this ever since on every presentation I've done as it relates to uh, classification. So. Um, those are the main three that we wanted to cover. We, we can look at the, these four, five, and six. Four is really, we use the word akin with four, and believe it or not, in rulings, I've utilized that word akin. And the reason I, I four is becoming a little more popular is that with the speed of technology today um, and the lack of speed with updating the harmonized tariff system, we find that technology is blending um, technologies of multiple, multiple machines and manufacturing and robotics and, and creating items that are really, really tough to classify. And, and, we, and we really have to look at something and say, well, that's really kind of like this. It's really akin to this. And that's where we would look at general rule four, but that's only if we can determine it based on the other three provisions prior to general four. But um, certainly if uh, the harmonized tariff system could uh, to keep up with technology, we, you know, we, we again, might, uh, might be able to find these a, a little bit quicker or might be able to see some of these a little bit differently. Um, general five is for cases. So if you, if you import a guitar and it comes in a case, the case is classified with the guitar. And then six is, um, again, breaking down subheadings, chapter notes, sub, sub notes of, of things that are there. And the last thing is the additional rules for the United States. And these rules are very specific to use provisions, okay? Meaning that they have to qualify and use the term as a snapshot at the time of the importation. What is the actual use at the time of importation? If you take that snapshot and it's intended for this use and you can validate that use within three years of the item and so forth, then that is the actual use of the item. And then it talks about parts and parts provisions because some tariff numbers um, we'll say in parts thereof, like we mentioned earlier, some won't have a parts provision. And if it doesn't have a parts provision, you can't make one up, okay? It, it, it is not the item. We have to look at the notes and the chapter notes, and maybe we have to classify that as a specific item. Um, and the last item is D, and that, that comes down to that rule XI, which is in mixtures such as for clothing. And that's 50-50 cotton, 50-50 uh, 
polyester, we utilize the one, those are the same rules and or we classify it using the last one in the, in the tariff. Um, here are those links that Allison had mentioned um, before um, that, that provide some, some great tools for, um, for helping to validate your classifications and helping to walk you through the classification. And the one I would be the, I, that you should absolutely get familiar with is the informed compliance publication. Because as we come full circle and we talk about one of the first slides that we shared, we talked about shared responsibility and informed compliance is customs job. So if, if you've got products that are identified in the informed compliance publications and you haven't read them, have you met your reasonable care standards? And I would certainly go to the informed compliance um, publications that are out on customs website and I would I would look for any products that are specific to you, look for definitions, look for tips, and make sure that you make that part of your compliance program. Print those off, save those into your compliance, teach people around you what those are, because um, there are some great ones. I utilize, uh, we have a lot of apparel clients, I utilize apparel all the time, mm -hmm. children's apparel, the definitions of apparel, and things like that. So anyways, I recommend that you use those. So that's kind of the, uh, just of the presentation piece. And again, we wanted to include a lot of slides because we believe this will be ammunition for you to, uh, to put together your compliance program and make sure that it is in fact uh, compliant. So we're gonna go through and, and answer the questions that you've submitted in advance, many of which have, have been submitted um, during, during today's presentation. And then in these questions, we're gonna go all over the place. Um, so let's start with um, our friend Sandy Osborne up in Nebraska. Um, Sandy attends and asks great questions um, all the time. Um, what are the pros and cons of asking your foreign manufacturer to be the US importer of record? That is a great question, Sandy. Um, I, I can take that one, Allison. If, um, my thought on, on the pros and cons of asking your foreign manufacturer to be the US importer of record is that if the goods are coming to you still, you still have a liability because you've initiated the importation, okay? So um, we need to make sure what is being reported to, uh, to customs falls under, under them completely. That includes, includes the security filing. They have the bonds in place that they need to as well. Um, and that, that you are only, only listed as a consignee and not mistakenly um, listed as the importer of record because many folks will, will say, well, you be the importer of record and I'll just pay it. Well, now you're talking about inco terms, mm -hmm. okay? And, and if the inco term is to your door and they're responsible for the payment, again, inco terms don't determine um, who has to be the importer of record. All they determine is who pays for what. So that would be my thing. And as, an, as a, someone that's worked on the import side and Allison has worked on the import side, I always encourage my importers to go ahead and take charge of that. Go ahead and be the importer of record. Buy on an FOB basis so you can control the freight, you can control the timing, you, can, you know that your security filing is being correct, done correctly, you know that the tariff classification is being done correctly, and that you're working with a customs broker that knows you and knows your business and knows your classifications, knows what products may or may not be subject to uh, the uh, PGAs, the, the partner government agencies. I'm sorry, I, I tend to call them other government agencies and get <laughs> laughed up in the office when I do that. Um, but the uh, partner government agencies and or anti-dumping or countervailing duties and things like that. So that is my, my thing um, um, between pros and cons. The pros of it are is that they, they should be taking care of everything. And it should just show up at your dock as scheduled without any uh, interference on your behalf, other than the fact that they would need to know your company EIN number. And again, that's going out to their forwarder of choice, which again, I don't like for um, integrity of data, for um, um, theft, theft of uh, business data and things like that. But, um, but you would need to provide that so that you could be the consignee of record on that customs entry because you do have to have a U.S. entity that acts as the consignee. So that would be my, my pros and cons. Do you have anything to add on no, to I, that? No, I think you nailed it. You know that. Um, and always happy to talk with you uh, about that anytime, Sandy. Um, we have also some, uh, some questions that were asked um, as people wonder. Here's one. Uh, should a company ever have more than one customs broker? I'll let you take that one, Allison. Why not? I mean, we have, how many brokers do we have here? 
in Kansas City alone, where we're at, probably 10, 15, 15, 13 to 15 customs yeah. brokers here. Honestly, just this one office. That's, I mean, that's pretty unheard of for, for a customs broker. You've worked for other companies where you've been yeah. the only licensed broker. The, the benefit is really the knowledge, the knowledge base, having many people to go and take and, you know, I, I'll go to Kevin and say, I'm trying to help classify this product for an importer. This is what I've come up with. And push it out together and follow through the steps to figure out what the best classification is. It's just really great to have a, a team of additional brokers to run things yeah. by. Yeah. I mean, the tariff, 19 CFR, identifies Section 111, identifies <laughs> a customs broker as an expert. We are considered experts, so to, to have multiple brokers and again i've worked for companies where i was the only customs broker licensed broker in the office and um and i've worked at companies where i only had one or two the more that we have i, I believe one it's it's um, it's just better to to again be able to bounce things off of be able to have your back when people call my office and maybe i can't get a hold of me i know that they license customs broker and as an importer Again, with the liabilities today that are out there, we just we talked about the beginning, kind of that court case that uh, just went through and that big penalty on the sugar importer. Being able to bounce things off of other people is a great thing to do. Um, someone asked um, in, in uh, registration about the uh, broker's exam. Okay, the broker's exam is, is again, it's, it's, a, it's a tough test um, to pass, I had, but the, but the Pass rate has increased on the broker's exam. The pass rate is now up in the 20 percentile, um, 20, 22 percent, which still seems low, but that's much better than, say, the 8 percent it was when I passed it um, over a decade ago. Um, so the, uh, the, the 10 percent um, uh, got it. Question, but anyway, so that so that the, the pass rate on the broker's exam is something that's uh, that's increased, and we've been encouraging folks to uh, to go out and, and take the test if they can. Um, that's really important for, for us. Um, I know that I've led over the last several years, three years, I've been leading a, a study group in the fall for the April exam. So we start roughly after Thanksgiving, and then we work until April, and we've had. Um, in the last two years, I've had five people from Scarborough that have taken the broker's exam, and four of them have passed. And I tell you what, that is one of the most proud things that, that, I, can, that I can say about our program and this company is that we want to encourage people to pass, and I'm so proud of all four of them for passing. But then we also have, we also have people that join our, our broker's exam study group that are our clients, that are local in, in, in town and, and or from around around the world, even we can we can facilitate that. But it just keeps us together, and it keeps us studying at a pace. And just if you want to learn things, we've had people here that weren't interested in taking the broker's exam. Maybe they work in the freight department or whatever it might be, but they wanted to learn more about the customs laws and regulations, and they joined our study group. And so, if you're interested in that, we've got kind of a program that you can follow on your own. And I've got I'm getting set up with a company to to be considered an instructor to be able to get discounts for people that are wanting to buy the materials and participate in our study group. Um, but it's really not you don't come to learn; you come to to, to stay on track. Um, so, anyways, if you're interested in that, please let me know. Email me, and we'll add you to the list, and maybe we can get a bunch of people to uh, to to study for it and and or pass it. Um, in the for the April exam if you're wanting to take it for the October exam I'm happy to send you kind of the schedule of studying that I that we follow and uh, And hook you up with the materials as well. So anyways, it's very important to do that And so I would, I would totally enjoy um, or encourage everybody to, to pass the exam hire additional customs licensed customs brokers on your team so that you have more exports because trade is not becoming simpler it is becoming more complex and things like that And then uh, another question that came in is, should we hire more than uh, one customs broker, such as Scarborough and say a uh, competitor for Scarborough? Should you have more than one customs broker um, as a company? And that's, that is a, uh, that's a good question as well. Um, on, the, on a question like that, should you have more than one customs broker? It depends on the nature of your business and how you want, how, what your risk profile is for, for, for that. 
Um, some companies do. They have more than one customs broker. We work with uh, clients that do. We don't have any problem with that. Um, I'll do as much or as little as you need me to do. Um, the thing is, is that if you have a good, strong internal program, then that works. If you don't have a good, strong internal program, then utilizing a single customs broker that's really going to know your business and try to protect you will probably be the best. So anyways, that's what, that's what I would encourage. So here's a question. How do you review the imported products against anti-dumping countervailing duty orders? Um, that's a great question. Um, I think for us internally, um, we utilize the ACE portal and I hope most of you are on the ACE portal. If you're not, they have a great tool for, for utilizing that. How does that work, Allison? It's a, it's a very quite simple tool actually. You just log into your portal there is a lookup where you can go in and type in your tariff. I usually start with the first four to six digits, okay. you know, um, the country it's shipping from, country of origin. Uh, you can also put in the name of the product. Say you're looking at hardwood flooring or mm -hmm. ball bearings. You can put that in there and search. There's several other options. You can put the name of your manufacturer in, and then it pulls up every case that's out there that may apply. To it may product. apply. So, that's excellent. So, and, and, and those, those rulings, and again, what she's looking at is she's looking at the scope ruling from the Department of Commerce, because the Department of Commerce issues an anti-dumping and countervailing duty orders, and she's reading through the scopes and helping to compare the items to see if it meets the scopes. If you were not sure, then the same process as a binding ruling is, is that you submit it to the Department of Commerce for a determination if it does or does not qualify. And I will tell you, that Department of Commerce is really, really good at making sure that things qualify for anti-dumping and countervailing duties. And, um, and the problem is, is that customs just has to enforce what they do. So sometimes you have to go that route and prepare that, uh, that um, scope ruling for the Department of Commerce. And it's, and it's laborsome to determine that. But that's a great tool. There's also a cross lookup that's out there. If you go to customs website and, and search for that, I believe it's like ADD slash CBD rulings or something yeah. like that. Um, but th that's out there as well to help read the scope. So the first thing you do is you read the scope and then you identify the manufacturers involved because they could have different duty rates for the manufacturers. And if you need help, we're the experts. Experts give us a call, okay? I think it's a great question though. How are we doing on time? Okay, we've still got, still got some time. When you're importing empty plastic water bottles, what kind of markings are required? Does FDA apply? That's again a good question. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, we probably need to know a little more specific about it, but um, let's think um, water bottle, bottles that you would put water in. So 3923, mm -hmm. if we're looking at tariff classification, it would right. be 3923, I think. And then it'll come down to say like bottles of plastic right. and some other things, right? Um, <laughs> and uh, and then if you're if you're looking at like sport bottles that you would you would take and put in your backpack and that the athletes drink and things like that that bottle I believe there's rulings on that that that's classified in chapter thirty nine twenty six mm -hmm. because it's not just a carrier of water it's it's a uh, it's specific type item and then it could possibly even be under thirty nine twenty four for household items right. of water so we've already identified three locations of of where that item is. So this is an anonymous um, sender here, but if, if we want to, if you want to send us that the specifics, we can look that up. And and Allison, on, on your side and your team, when when they're when they type in an item, they get flags and things like that, right? Right. right. So and so these probably all flag for FDA I'm or sure FD1. They would probably all flag FD1. FD1 is just a flag that's in the custom system that says this item may or may not qualify for uh, for FDA requirements. So that's how we determine it. So if you know the tariff number of your item, you can send that to Allison. She can plug it in there and say if it's FD1 or if it's all the way up to like FD4, which is mandatory. You have to input the FDA data elements or not. So anyways, that would be a great question to, uh, to ask her um, and feel free to do. What is the difference between the Schedule B and the HTS number? Um, I love the question um, because it gets asked all the time and, and we work with a lot of companies that both do import and export together, but the Schedule B number is, is really, it, it is specific to exports. Schedule B equals exports. 
It is the harmonized tariff number. That book is smaller and it's pretty much essentially getting you that six digits as Allison had mentioned earlier, that six digits is recognized globally um, among all participating members. I think there's 196 participating members that subscribe to the harmonized tariff system. But to that number of people, um, it's really identifying that first six digits along with a couple that are needed for census purposes. Um, the harmonized tariff number, though, can be used for either because that is the HTS US version um, of the harmonized tariff system. And um, what I encourage all of you to do, whether you're an importer and or exporter, is get rid of your Schedule B. I know it's easier and I know, um, but, but utilize only the harmonized tariff system number, the HTS US number for your imports and exports, especially if you are importing and exporting. If you're just exporting, Schedule B is fine, but if you are importing, focus on the one number because the harmonized tariff number, the HTS US, can actually be used on export. Okay, so instead of having a database of two numbers, let's go down to one because that's easier to manage. Um, and it prevents confusion as to what the actual number is in case it's ex imported and or you're an exporter that returns the goods, something like that potentially. So that's what my recommendation is, is, is as it relates to, uh, to those. Um, so I hope that answered it. Can you clarify what you meant by a binding ruling? Allison, you want to talk about binding rulings? Binding rulings. A binding ruling is when you go and you basically apply to customs to get their approval, their determination that the, the HTS code that you're using is the correct code and that you are able to use that code on every one of those imports going forward. Um, I know there's cases where people will apply for them, they don't get it. The maybe custom says, no, we don't agree with your, mm -hmm. with your request and you have to go back to maybe a higher duty rate, which you don't agree with. And that's usually a yep. lot of the reasons we see people apply for finding rulings yep. is to try to get a lower duty rate, yep. to get customs to agree with you that yes, you are correct yep. with, this, with this rate that you've chosen. So. Yeah, our goal is always to get you the lowest legal duty rate, meaning that it's classified 100% correctly and that you're paying the duty that you should be paying. And so in that binding ruling process, you know, you take, you take all the materials about the goods, about the use, about the materials, the, the bill of materials as well, and, and uh, copies of the items, pictures of the items, physical items, actually send in the item to customs and the uh, national, and they, they will review it um, in uh, New York and or headquarters, depending on where you send it to be reviewed. And they will actually review the item and everything that you submit to help you determine what that tariff classification is. And then they give you a binding ruling number and that ruling number you give to your customs broker like Scarborough and we input it in every customs entry that you have. And then that, that, that lets all the ports know that this has been reviewed at, uh, uh, by headquarters um, of what the ruling actually is. And so it's a great, great tool that is often uh, underutilized um, when it comes to uh, tariff classification. So uh, again, I, I encourage people to do the binding rulings. You can look up binding rulings at um, what's called Cross Customs Ruling Online um, System. Um, so you can go there and look up rulings. Have, go there and type in my last name. You'll see several rulings that I've, I've submitted for, and some of those I have people on this call today that I've done rulings for, and, and sometimes we're arguing for use provisions, sometimes we're arguing for chapter 98, 9811, for articles of the line because of actual use, whatever it might be, but those are reasons to, to go for binding rulings. I think we answered that one. Man, we've got a lot of great questions. Binding rulings. <clears throat> okay, I am struggling with our engineers. Amen to that. Everybody, everybody just went, yeah, we all do. <laughs> um, and classifying parts. They're trying to avoid sending out the original ECN from form that, that used to come through to different departments, such as our import department for classifying. We make the final decision, however, and this is causing hundreds of emails back and forth. How would you recommend approaching this situation just so then that there's 
more to classification than just thinking everything is parts thereof. That is a, man, that is a battle that I know I faced when I was on the importer side working with engineers and I can feel your pain um, as well. I think the key with anything we do when we're talking about customs and customs compliance and building a compliance program is number one, you must have support from upper management and or ownership that, that identifies the importance of having a compliance program. That's number one. Okay, if you have that, then it's about establishing processes and procedures for classifying products. I know that in the company I worked for, an article couldn't be purchased from overseas unless I gave the harmonized tariff number. So they couldn't even buy the product, which means they absolutely had to give me everything that I needed. Okay, um, but, but, but that was, again, uh, it reported to legal and legal got, you know, if, if I wasn't getting in. So we set some rules and, and examples of specific items that you're going to need every time and who you're going to need them from. For example, when you're classifying a product, you know, determining uh, eligibility for uh, for each trade agreements, things like that, you have to have, you know, build materials that's complete. You have to know what all the items are that are on there. You might have to get that information from engineering um, or manufacturing. You may also have to get values from, uh, from accounting um, as it relates to some of those items as well. So anyways, the problem with import compliance is it does branch across multiple multiple uh, um, places inside your organization, and therefore you have to have the, uh, the, the support from upper management and put together a detailed list of all the things that you need every single time, and even a checklist to make sure that you get them. Um, and or another thing you can do, and we've been doing this a ton, is invite Scarborough in to come do some training. We would be happy to stand in front of some engineers and answer the questions that talk about how important your job is in import compliance because sometimes bringing us experts in um, can help push that needle in the direction that you want and we can talk about um, the specifics that you need in order to classify your product and why you do it and maybe encourage them to provide that along with the liabilities because when you start talking about these penalties of fraud, negligence, and gross negligence, them not complying and, and um, subjecting your company to risk is a very big deal, and that's why I included it in this uh, presentation today, is to make sure that you knew what your risk was. So that, that would be my recommendations for, for handling something like that. And again, it's not easy. And trust me, I, I've been there, and we've had, we've, I've done these presentations to lots of people, um, lots of companies, many on, on this call today, and, uh, and, and it takes, takes a bit of time, and it takes, um, so anyways, I encourage you to reach out if you need our help because we're happy to, happy to come help. Um, I would like to find out the holdups and issues we can face that lead to delays of entries and ways to avoid these. Um, that is a good question. And Allison, since you're in charge of an op major operation and we see these, mm -hmm. why don't we tackle this from, from what you see? You know, what customers right, provide right. you that you see electronically that helps to helps you to narrow down specific examples of what's actually going on. Because I think a lot of times customs brokers get a bad rap because mm -hmm. we say, um, and not to Scarborough, but that, oh, it's just on a whole. And we're maybe not as specific right, as we right. need to be and or can be. So maybe talk about it. And there's that there's and what you really see the most of. a lot of reasons that, you know, shipments can be slowed down. Um, anything from an ISF wasn't filed. So it gets put on an ISF hold at, at port and has to be examined uh, to an egg hold because they're inspecting the containers for creepy crawlies. <laughs> that <laughs> happens this time of year quite frequently. And then, you know, just general lack of information. Sometimes if we don't have a commercial invoice or tariff classifications, um, delays caused by missing PGA data. Mm -hmm. If we don't have your, um, if you're bringing in FDA products and we need your, your manufacturer's FDA registration number, we can't transmit your entry until we have it. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's really a lot of, of pieces to the puzzle, mm -hmm. but if you get all the information you can up front and to your broker as soon as possible from the day that shipment's ready to go, I think the smoother the process is going to go for everybody. Yeah. I mean, I would agree. And and kind of at the beginning of our presentation, Allison outlined the documents that are required. And in there, she specifically had the invoice, the packing list, 
the bill of lading, the certificate of origin, if applicable, like you're trying to prove a origin or, and or uh, validate a preferential treatment claim. And she also mentioned the PGA data, FDA, USDA, any of those, uh, ATF, any of those other government agencies that, that participate in the import process of having all of that information and having it to the broker. And I know like in our system, we can put all of that information in advance. I mean, we can, there's no reason to wait for the time of importation. Let's get together, let's put, upload your items, let, uh, let's upload your product codes if it's FDA, um, and all of that information in our system so that we know that we have that well. Mm -hmm. And my question back to, to, to the asker as well is, how, how strong is your program? Um, do you have requirements for all of your invoices that they maintain all of the correct accurate descriptions, um, ac accurate tariff numbers, country of origin? Does it have all the requirements that are on there or that are required by, by customs? Because there is a specific outline and, and a list of recommendations for invoice requirements. And does your invoice comply from your vendors and do you hold them accountable? Because if you do, then you're probably going to come through a little bit quicker. Um, again, I, 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 use, I like to use the say, saying garbage in, garbage out. Um, if, you're, if your invoice has item one, two, three, and that's all it says on there, well, nobody knows what that is. And if you're looking from a customs perspective, does it say item one, two, three is a, is a cell phone? And then does it have the proper tariff classification for a cell phone, if that's what you're importing, or the water bottles earlier? Because if, if they all equal, if cell phone equals that tariff number, equals the value is correct, all of those things, then it should be easier for customs to determine. If customs can't determine that, then you're likely going to see a hold, um, would be my recommendation. Mm -hmm. So again, it's getting things done right up front and in advance, as Allison had mentioned, and working with your broker to make sure that they have that data so that when it's transmitted one as soon as possible, um, that it's out there. And then if there is a hold, then work with the customs broker to identify the specific type of hold that's being done. And again, she sees that, she sees if there's a security filing hold or if there's an FDA hold or a USDA hold, we get that transmitted back to us so that we, we can relay it to you so that you don't think your product was held every time, but in a sense, it was held five different times for five different reasons versus the same reason. And that might also help you to, to navigate and make sure that, that, that you know what's going on. So that, that would be my recommendations. Um, Food Safety Modernization Act requires use of identification numbers such as a DUNS number to be on the import documentations for food and feed items. Which documents should contain that number? Allison, I'll let you go take this. Um, you know, we see this a lot. Um, we have clients that do it a couple different ways. Um, the manufacturer will either supply it on the commercial invoice. We also have uh, importers that will provide us like a broker's letter of instruction and they'll break it down there. It, it honestly doesn't really matter to us what form it comes in. It's just, it's a data element that we need to transmit to customs and we can record that and save it behind your manufacturer in our system so that it's there. Um, for every shipment um, but that's just it's just a data element that we need to transmit so it doesn't really there's no specific way it needs to be listed on your documentation. So it's all about providing the correct information that's mm -hmm. great thank you. Um, we're running a little late and we will stay a little late if you will but we, we want to get through these other questions. Is there a percentage that defines a complete for general rule two? And, it's, and there is not a specific rule on that one. Um, and we can talk more specifics if you have an item that you believe falls under that general rule of interpretation, happy to analyze that with you um, as needed. Just email me. Um, Carla Weber, would you please give me more details about countervailing duty on bearings? Is that based on type of bearing, origins, or man and manufacturers, question mark? All of the above. <laughs> All of the above, yeah, it is. Um, with any type of item, that's anti-dumping and or countervailing. They look at one, first of all, they usually look at the origin because it's usually specific to an origin, but you could have the same product that has multiple origins, I'm thinking, um, where, where anti-dumping and countervailing cases could apply. So one, you're gonna look at the tariff number and the origin, and Allison gave a great recommendation of going on to ACE's website and putting in the tariff number and the, and the country of origin to see what cases come up. And then once you look at that, now you're looking at specific manufacturers because your manufacturer might have submitted a scope ruling that allows them to uh, get their own specific duty rate. So anti-dumping and countervailing is very, very complex. Um, things get held up in court cases as well, and which aren't as easy to see inside of 
the scopes and right. things that are out there, you kind of get wind of the court case and then you're following the scopes and you're following the, the Court of International Trade's court case. So it becomes a very, very complex. And then often some of those orders are lifted um, as well. And that means that things are no longer you know, subject to. But it's, uh, it's a very complex process. Um, but it is all of the items. And, and if you're, you're wanting to put any type of process or procedure or we need to educate anybody else, in your company, Carla, please uh, let me know, email me, and we can maybe help work with the, the language that you need to use in that situation. Will Scarborough advise me if goods qualify for GSP or any free trade agreements? Allison, will you notify them? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. Um, and our system will flag us that it's a possibility that your goods may qualify for GSP. And that's you know, very triggered to contact you to find out do you have your certificates of origin to prove that we can claim GSP on this product or NAFTA or whatever the, yep. whatever the free trade agreement may be. Yeah, you, you bet. I, I'll vouch that my team uh, that, that Allison manages and all the branch managers that we have around me, around the country, they do an excellent job of, allowing the system to identify those potential savings. Because remember, we want you to pay the, the lowest legal duty rate on your products at all times. And again, there's there's process to qualifying many of those, but if it flags that it, it's potential savings, you should hear from hear from us that says, hey, looks like there this could qualify. Do you have a certificate of origin? Can you can you get one to make sure that it, it does in fact qualify or get a manufacturer's affidavit, something from the, uh, the the vendor and or supplier or manufacturer to make sure that it does in fact qualify? So that's a great question. And again, we're here to help and be part of that. I mentioned at the beginning, collaborate with you and, and make sure that we're part of your growth opportunities. Um, will this actual will the uh, actual recording uh, be sent to me? Yes, yes. Um, what we always do um, is we we are recording this presentation. We are recording the slides, and and here in uh, in a couple days or a week, give us a week. Um, usually, it doesn't take that long, but we will send you a link to not only the slides but the presentation, and all of this will be out on our YouTube channel, and there will be links on our on our website as well with the frequently asked questions that were asked here today. And we segregate all of these um, all of these presentations into their own frequently asked questions, so that they're easy for reference. And then the, the YouTube video, I know many of you utilize it for training internally, um, and we're getting great feedback on that. But anyways, they will be available. They always are. If you miss one, you don't register. You can find it out on our YouTube channel and our website. Um, so we're we're happy to provide that. So we have uh, we have surpassed our our allotted time. We usually like to keep these specifically to an hour, but we've got a great audience that asked great questions today. Um, I would like to thank you all for attending. I would like to thank Allison for for participating in this uh, pres this webinar with me as well. And uh, we wish everybody luck in in a compliant program. So thank you again for coming.